Transportation has modernized many people's life, but also generated a lot of issues. Traffic congestion, energy consumption, and air pollution. Tackling these challenges seems nearly impossible years ago, given the complex setting of the city. But recently, the advances in sensing technology and the large-scale computing infrastructures has, have generated a lot of big data, from traffic data to uh, meteorological data, from map data to social media. When used correctly, we can solve the problem we are facing by using data aggregately. Motivated by this opportunity, and we come up with a vision on urban computing since 2008, uh, which is comprised of four major layers, from urban sensing to urban data management and urban data analytics, and then service providing. We collected the four layers into a recurrent and unobtrusive loop for improving, pe improving people's life and uh, city operating system and the environment. So in short, we are going to solve the big challenge in big city by using big data. So here is a survey paper on urban computing at TIST um, before, I was, uh, before I became the uh, editor-in-chief here. Um, but today, we only have a very limited time. So I focus on two layers, considering the uh, culture of this conference, KDD. Um, here, I will focus on data management and the, the data analytics. Okay? So let's go to the uh, urban data management layer. So here we are looking at three problems. One is data, second is um, the platform, the third is indexing and retrieval algorithm. So in order to have a very efficient urban data management system, you have to look at uh, three problems. Spatial temporal data, um, cloud computing platform, and indexing and retrieval algorithms. So let's go to the data first. So in urban space, we can collect a diversity of data from social media and from traffic data. They are associated with spatial and temporal properties. So in terms of this structure, we can categorize urban big data into two groups, uh, either point-based data or network-based data. For example, point of interest data is point, kind of point data. And network data is uh, uh, network data is network-based uh, data structure. And also in terms of spatial and temporal properties, we can parti um, divide data into three categories, uh, indicated by the three columns. So one type of data is called spatial temporal static data. That means its spatial property and temporal property does not change over time. For example, the point of interest data is static. Once the point of interest has been built in the city, for example, a restaurant, a shopping mall, its location does not change over time. And every property of this building is fixed, okay? But some data has a static position, but with dynamic readings. For example, once we deploy some sensor, like uh, meteorological data, okay, derived from some sensors, the location of the sensor is static, but the reading from sensor changing over time. So it's called spatial static, but temporal dynamic, dynamic data. Um, the most complex, uh, of uh, data is the trajectory data, uh, which is comprised of a sequence of points. I mean, the location of a, of a, a moving object is changing over time, and the reading from each location also changes over time. For example, uh, the trajectory of a vehicles moving around the city, okay? um, the position of the vehicles changing over time, and the heading direction is travel speed of the vehicle changing over time. So. And also, there is a structure between consecutive points. So there are six categories of data in the city. No matter what kind of data you can imagine in the city, we can fit them into one out of the six models. Okay, so we first we define six data models to accommodate urban big data. And what's unique about spatial temporal data? Uh, in terms of spatial properties, we can see there's a distance between objects. Well, of spatial temporal data. Um, there's an intuitive, um, I mean, geographic, the first law of geography. Everything is related, um, but new things are more related. So this figure shows the similarity between the air quality reading of two locations, changing over the distance between the two locations. It's very intuitive. As the distance between two locations increase, the similarity 
of the air quality between the two locations decrease. So this is very intuitive. And there is also hierarchy. I mean, hierarchical property between locations. You can imagine the hierarchy of a location as um, a city layout. For example, a city is comprised of some districts, and each district is further comprised of some neighborhoods. So information at a different granularity of location brings us different level of information. People share more information at a fine grain level location um, are really more similar than people share uh, location at the cost level locations. So we have to model the granularity of location by considering hierarchical information. Um, regarding the temporal information, what's unique about spatial temporal data? There are three perspectives. One is called temporal closeness. It's very intuitive. The temperature of current hour is more similar to the temperature of uh, past hour. And as the time, as the time interval increases, the similarity de decreases. But sometimes there is outlier, we call periodic, um, period. The traffic condition of this morning, let's say 8 a.m., is very, maybe very similar to that of yesterday. It, I mean, 8 a.m. of last, uh, last uh, yesterday but might be not similar to the traffic at 12 p.m. today, even if 12 p.m. is even closer to 8 a.m. this morning. So there's a traffic pattern, um, periodic pattern uh, in the data. So this is very different from some text data. And also there's a trend information, trend in the um, period information. So for example, as the temperature decreases, people woke up, well, wake up, later and later in the morning. So the early traffic hours come later and later. So there's a rising trend of the um, traffic, um, traffic speed in, in a given time slot, uh, in the given time, uh, at a given time stamp. So to consider the spatial temporal information, we have to model the spatial temporal property very well. This is a unique thing about spatial temporal data. So next is the urban, urban big, bap, uh, urban big uh, data platform. When you think about the platform, you might uh, think about cloud computing. Okay, there's a gap between the diversity of data we have and the diversity of application we are going to enable. So the application of urban computing is usually large scale, and we have to answer users' question in an um, instantaneous manner. So there's a gap between the two sides. How, unfortunately, current urban computing platform cannot support spatial temporal data very well because of the following three reasons. First, the structure of spatial temporal data is very different from text data and image data. For example, um, the trajectory, okay, let's consider the trajectory data. The trajectory is a sequence of time ordered points. And the trajectory, the length of trajectory keeps on increasing as time goes by. It's not fixed, okay? And second the reason is the query. When we query uh, documents, we, we usually query documents by keywords. But when you query spatial temporal data, it's very unique. You give a spatial temporal range, let's say check the um, taxi around me in the past one minute. So the query is very different from a traditional keywords match. And third, we need to harness the diversity of data in the city. So we need to organize the data very, very well. And we will need to do some hybrid index to well organize multiple data sets from different domain because we need to use them together in one application. So this is three unique things bring challenges to current cloud computing service. So we build some um, intermediate layer based on cloud computing. Okay, so this is the sixth type of data model we defined for spatial temporal data in terms of data structure and spatial temporal properties. And this is current, uh, this is existing storage provided by a cloud computing service like table, uh, blob, and SKU server. And this is our contribution. We build an intermediate layer based on current cloud computing infrastructure. First, we de design some spatial index, spatial and spatial temporal indexing structure, and in integrate the spatial temporal indexing structure into cloud computing environment like Storm, Spark, and Hadoop. 
and we provide API to upper level applications that allow people to quickly core different type of data efficiently. Um, the efficient management of uh, data is very, very useful itself. Uh, let's say we can search uh, web and taxi run ours in the past one minute. And we can also support uh, machine learning and data mining tasks above the, this layer. Okay. Let me give you one example to demonstrate the capability of data management. So here we're trying to suggest some location for deploying a charging station for electrical vehicles. Supposing we are going to select two locations here, where should we put this station so that these two stations can cover the maximum number of vehicles? So this is actually a submodular maximization problem, which is NP hard. Okay? It's very inefficient. But we can make this process very efficient by using this platform we built. Let me give you one uh, illustration. Okay. Okay. So this is a real system we built in Guiyang City. Um, based on the taxi trajectory in the past one month, we are going to deploy five charging stations for electrical vehicles in this given area. By using this platform, we can generate the results very efficiently in seconds. But without this platform, we need to wait for a couple of days until generating one round of results. But wait a minute, sometimes the place suggested by this algorithm may not work for us because sometimes there may not be enough space. And also, we need to consider the point of interest around this area. For example, we need to charge, uh, we need to spend a couple of hours to charge our stations, uh, charge our vehicles. But where people can go? So you need to consider about whether there's a restaurant or shopping mall around these places. So if there's no such kind of facility around these places, we need to remove the results, okay? For instance, this is a, uh, not qualified, so we can remove these places and let the algorithm to regenerate the results. So this is the iterative data mining process. We say interactive visual data analytics supported by cloud computing. Without this platform, you cannot do such kind of interactive visual data analytics. Data analytics. So one round of results will cost you a couple of days. But now with our platform, we can generate the results in a few seconds. So this is a um, example demonstrating the capability of the platform. Uh, this is an enhanced cloud computing platform dedicated for spatial temporal data. So this is a unique, okay? Um, later, I will focus on this layer of urban data analytics. I will show you some examples. But before we step into some real projects, I will summarize the challenge of this layer. The first one is, as we know, the major machine learning algorithm was designed for image and the computer vision. But now we are dealing with spatial temporal data. How can we adapt machine learning algorithm from image data to spatial temporal data? That's the first challenge. Second, um, traditional data mining usually, usually focus on mining one type of data. But now we have a diversity of data in urban computing. And we need to harness them together in one application. How we can mine multiple data sets instead of single data set? The third one is, um, in a real project, we need to um, have a knowledge from database and machine learning. But there, apparently, there are two different communities. People barely talk to each other. But now we need to have the knowledge of both sides. The third is how to enable interactive visual data, data analytics. So this is very challenging. We cannot request the algorithm to generate all the results in one round. We can request the uh, algorithm to generate some preliminary results then people can filter and refine the results based on domain knowledge. So people are involved in the mining process. So that's very important. So let me give you some example, okay? The first one is we're trying to improve urban planning by using big data. Uh, we're trying to identify some um, design in your network that does not work very well or does not work very well any longer, okay? So here we partition a city by major roads, uh, by windows and highways, and each region is bounded by major roads. So people live in regions. So people live in regions and travel between regions. The traffic congestion on road segments 
adjust observations. So we're trying to identify some region pairs that are not well connected, or the connection between the two region pairs cannot support current traffic very well. So we project the tra taxi trajectory data over the past three years onto these regions and formulating some regional graph. Let's see. Well, each node stands for a region, and each blue link between two nodes means the aggregation of commutes of taxis be traveling between the two regions. Okay. Now we are trying to identify some links between two regions based on the real data. How can we define the two regions is not very connected? Uh, we can extract three features from each link. One is the traffic volume. That means the number of vehicles traveling from one region to another one. The, another, the second feature is uh, the travel speed. The true travel speed of these vehicles traveling between the two regions. The third one is the um, detour ratio. I mean, um, a ratio between the actual travel distance of vehicles and the Euclidean distance between the two regions. So the bigger the ritual is, the longer detour people have to make when traveling between the two regions. Then we can formulate a three dimension space based on the three feature we just identified. Traffic volume, travel speed, and the uh, detour ritual. We're trying, what, what kind of uh, um, region pair are not well connected? Those red segment with a bigger traffic volume and slow travel speed and the very big detour ratio are not well connected. So we can use some scanline detection to find out some points. Uh, I mean, some, some row segments corresponding to the region pairs without any predefined thresholds. So for example, we can look at the two dimension space. One is a uh, velocity, another one is the uh, detour ratio. We can see there's no points that simultaneous have a bigger detour ratio and a smaller uh, velocity than any point from this line. So this line is called scan line. And the point from this line probably are region pairs with bad design. Okay. But we cannot define this problem by only data of one day. We can check data of multiple days. If the problem occurs very frequently, then it will be caused by could be caused by the design rather than a traffic accident. So we perform such kind of algorithm for the data of each day and see what kind of problem frequently occurred. We formulate this problem as a frequent subgraph pattern mining problem. Okay. So this is day one problem, day two problem, day three problem. We can see what kind of problem occurred very frequently across multiple days. So this is a real problem we detect in Beijing based on data of the past two years. Um, so how can we evaluate? Then we can compare the results of consecutive two years and see whether the change makes sense. For instance, there was a bottleneck between the two regions because many people are went to enter in the fourth region of through two regions. But later, this road has been upgraded. People got additional choice to enter, for, enter the fourth region road through this path. Then this, this problem disappeared. So from this sense, you can see um, the upgrade of this rule segment really solved this problem. So there are two aspects of contribution of this research. From data of one year, we can detect problem we have in the city. And from data of consecutive years, we can evaluate the new facility we have just built in the city, whether the city, whether the new facility really work or not. Okay. This is the first example using our mobility data and road network data to identify the bad design in the city's road network. The second one is related to um, real estate, the value of real estate. We are not going to predict the price of a real estate, of a real estate which is really, really hard. But the value of real estate is rankable. I mean, given the same market, if it's a right market, which one increase faster? and decrease slower, slower than the other one, okay? So, um, more specifically, we can calculate the increase for each real estate and divide it by its price. We can calculate the increased rate for each real estate. Then we can rank this real estate in terms of increasing rate. And we can uh, discretize this ranking by five categories. First category is the biggest, the best, best one. 
and five fifths category is the last one. Okay. So there are a lot of application for this research. But how to define the value of a real estate? Location, location, location. Okay. And how to quantify the location, location, location? They can quantify it by different type of data. Okay. So the first location is actually the geographic utility, um, which is, can be um, characterized by real network data and point of interest data. Let's say how many restaurants around my house, how many shopping malls are there, and what's the clothes, um, how many bus stops and subway stations in this region. These features are very important to determine the value of a real estate, okay? But they're static. Second, we need to look at the dynamic data, not human mobility data. We need to check how many, how many people would reach this area in a given time slot. Uh, how many people would reach a place by taxi, would reach this place by subway station, or by subway, or by bus. The human mobi mobility actually characterizes the function of the region and also indicate the value of this region. And also we look at the social media data. What's the sentiment of people on, this, on the POIs around this area? Apparently, there are many types of schools. Um, a very high quality primary school may increase the value of a real estate tremendously than a normal primary school, right? You have this experience. Um, the third category of data is uh, called prosperity of the community where this real estate is located. So there are one location, second location, third location. So they can be quantified by different type of data, like point of interest data, uh, social media data, um, taxi trajectory data, and the bus, uh, car swiping car, uh, car swiping data in bus stations. Okay, and then we can extract feature from different type of data. And then we can put the feature together, do a some feature fusion. Okay. Um, here we have some constraint to eight. So this is a very simple linear regression. Supposing x is a feature, uh, the feature vector combining all the features from different data sets. So this is a very intuitive uh, regression process. This is the increasing value we're going to predict. And this is a feature, and this is an omega parameter. But wait a minute. If there are many features from different domains are dependent, they're not independent or redundant, so can we is some constraint to minimize the redundancy. So here we add two constraints. So one is a pairwise constraint. We require the prediction of each individual real estate accurate, and we also uh, require the order between the two real estate consistent. I mean, if one real estate increases faster than another one, the order of this real estate should be ranked before a slower one. So this is called pairwise uh, ranking constraint. Another one is uh, um, sparsity regularization for the omega. So as I said, there are many features redundant, are redundant, uh, or non uh, not independent, the independent. So we think majority of the redundant feature um, should not be used in the, in the model. So we can minimize the the value of omega for such kind of features. So we give a constraint requiring the, omega, the distribution of omega following a Gaussian distribution with a zero mean and a very narrow standard deviation. So in this case, the majority of omega will fall in a very uh, close to zero. Uh, that means they don't function in the, in the model. Okay, so this is the second example. Um, the third example, we are going to tackle urban pollution, uh, air quality pollution in the city. So this is a big headache in, in China okay, and in developing countries as well. Okay. Uh, government has built many uh, real air quality monitoring stations on the ground to inform the ambient air quality every hour. So each blue point stands for one air quality monitoring station. But such kind of stations is very big and very expensive. It's not very small. Okay. So we cannot build such kind of station everywhere. But in reality, the air quality change over time and the location tremendously. So this is a replay of the real data uh, in Beijing. So where each icon stands for one um, air quality monitoring station, and the number associated with each icon means air quality index. The smaller the better, uh, the bigger the worse. Green means very good, and red means unha very unhealthy. 
as you can see, even at the same moment, the, the reading from nearby station can be dramatically different. Uh, this is not surprising to see this phenomenon as air quality is influenced by multiple complex factors such as traffic flow, land use, and the density of building, and fine grained meteorology. Okay? So the problem is we cannot really understand uh, what's the air quality in this place if there's no monitoring station built. We cannot use some linear interpolation to solve this problem. As you can see, the air quality is highly nonlinear, changing over spaces. Okay. To solve this challenge, we combine two parts of big data to predict a fine grain air quality throughout the entire city. Uh, here, fine grain means one kilometer by one kilometer um, region. Uh, real time means we do such kind of inference every hour. Uh, the two parts of data are uh, real time and historical air quality data from existing stations and also five additional data sources, like meteorological data, uh, like wind speed, temperature, humidity, etc. Uh, traffic data, travel speed in the region, uh, p human mobility data, point of entry data, and real network data. I mean, how many intersections, how many traffic lights in the area. And then we can use machine learning model to build the relationship uh, between the data we observe in a region and the air quality of the region. Later, by using this model, we train from the data we observed, we can infer the air quality throughout the entire city, even if there's no station built, okay? So such kind of fine grain information can really inform government decision making. Um, so this is a real system we deploy in city, uh, in China. Now it's, it covers 300 cities in China and deployed with Chinese Ministry of Environmental Protection. So it's really used, okay? Uh, you can see this fine grain information of air quality throughout the entire city. Uh, we put together the data from multiple cities to do such kind of uh, inference. Because sometimes the problem may not um, come from the city itself, may come from its neighborhoods. Okay. With such kind of information, government can track where the pollution comes from. And, and people can make some decision on where and when go hiking. So let me mention a little bit about the model itself because we need a fusion multiple data sets. As I said, how to combine multiple data sets to do data mining is a key challenge of this layer. So here I'll give you a very brief idea. So each white circle denotes a station that have been, has been built by government. And the blue circle means the location we are going to infer. We don't have the idea, or we don't know the air quality of these places. And each slice denotes one timestamp, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m. First. The air quality of one location has a temporal dependency, which is indicated by these broken arrows. Second, air quality of different locations has a special correlations um, denoted by the red arrows, because the air pollutants may be blown from one place to another place. So a good model has to simultaneous model the temporal dependency between air quality of the same location and the co special correlation of air quality between different locations. So here we employ a semi-supervised learning model called co-training, uh, where we have a special classifier to model special uh, uh, correlation and temporal classifier to model temporal correlation between one, uh, different time stamp in one location. Then the two classifier has a mutually reinforcement learning process in the co-training framework. So you can refer to the uh, paper for more details. The first step is to real-time um, inference, and second time to forecast the future. So in the second step, we can forecast air quality over the next 48 hours. Well, for the next six hours, we can do an hourly prediction. And for the next 7 to 12, to 13 to 40, uh, 24, it's a maximum mean range of air quality in, in the time uh, interval. So it's also available. And this is the second paper we published at KDD. So, um, the past paper was also published at KDD. So now the current service covers through uh, 300 cities. You can see uh, it looks like a satellite map, but it's uh, based on our platform. Okay. The accuracy is about 75% accurate in seven, the first six hours in Beijing and more accurate in other cities. So this is a prediction against ground truth. You can see how tremendously air quality change, change over time. Okay. And we have a developed mobile apps that allow end users to check air quality throughout the entire city anytime, anywhere, and also the prediction. <coughs> so this is about air pollution, but I think actually the model can be applied to other problems, even for traffic, even for other 
meteorological information inference. Um, the third project is about energy consumption and, tr and also um, related to transportation and urban planning. So let me ask you two questions before we step into this project. Um, how many liters of gas has been consumed by vehicles traveling in the entire San Francisco in the past one hour? Who can figure out this problem? How many liters of gas has been consumed, have been consumed by vehicles traveling in the city in the past one hour? So this sounds like an interview problem of Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really challenging. I, I, I don't know the answer if, if I don't do the research. I thought nobody knows ground truth. There's no ground truth, but it's very important because it's related to environmental protection and also related to energy consumption. So the second problem is, uh, question is very related. The how many, traf uh, port, how many air pollution, particular matter with a diameter smaller than 2.5 uh, micrometer that have been issued by these vehicles. Because this is a very important uh, air pollutants that affect our hairs. Okay, so what we do here is we can infer the travel speed, traffic volume, gas consumption, and pollution emission of vehicles throughout the entire city on every and each road segment based on GPS trajectory of a sample of vehicles and combine data from point of interest data and the road network data and the meteorological data. Okay. So it's also a data fusion problem. You have to use multiple data sets to solve one problem uh, because it's really complicated. Um, <coughs> this is a very challenging task. It's not, it's not uh, traffic prediction on one road segment. It's an entire city with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of segments. Okay. You have to answer the user's query uh, instantaneously. Uh, give me the data of past 10 minutes. I, I need to return the results in one minute. So this is very difficult. Only having the platform I mentioned before, then you can derive these results. So let me show you real results. Uh, this is a system we deploy in, in Guiyang, one city in China. It's a pilot city for big data in China. Um, here we can show you the travel speed, traffic volume, and energy consumption on each and every segment throughout the city and changing over time. I want to emphasize traffic volume is totally different from travel speed. How to define traffic volume? That means the number of vehicles traversing a given road segment in a given time slot. That's traffic volume. So when there are traffic congestion, the traffic volume is small, not big. So that may break your imagination. Okay? Tra travel speed, travel, uh, traffic density, and traffic volume, that's three factors affecting each other. So knowing travel speed does not mean you know traffic volume, okay? And uh, second, we can infer the uh, gas consumption or the pollution emission like um, carbon monoxide, uh, nitrogen monoxide, etc., etc. Uh, information from every segment. So how we can make it? It's a three-step approach. Um, this paper was also published at KDD last year. Uh, uh, I think the year before last year. So the first step, we can infer the charge speed on each route segment, uh, each route segment based on sparse trajectory data, because we only have a sample of wow, trajectory from uh, sem uh, trajectory from sample of vehicles. Um, here we use taxi trajectory to infer the travel speed throughout the entire city. As we know, we only have very few taxis in the city. Uh, the majority of the route segment does not have a taxi traversing the route segment. So the travel speed, we don't know that. Here we use a uh, carport matrix vectorization method to solve this problem, combining real network data and points of, data, uh, point of interest data to infer the travel speed throughout the entire city. And second, we can infer the traffic volume based on travel speed and other data sets. Here we use a graphing model to do an unsupervised learning process because we don't really have training data. Okay, so this is the second step. Um, the third step, we can employ existing function from environmental theory. Uh, once we know uh, the travel speed of a week of certain type of vehicles, and we know the traffic volume, we can calculate the traffic uh, gas consumption and pollution emission of such kind of vehicles. But wait a minute, how do you know uh, this, the, the configuration of different cars? Okay. 
Here we just do some statistic data from a city. For example, in Beijing, uh, the average capacity of vehicles is about 1.4 to 2.0 liter, okay? And the average life of vehicles is five years. And they're using European standard three emission standards. So knowing such kind of configuration, you can uh, generally estimate or statistically estimate traffic emission of these vehicles. Um, so that's how we made it, okay? So the last point, uh, what I want to emphasize uh, transfer learning. Actually, in different example, I use a different data fusion method. I will give you a summary on this method at the end of this slide deck, okay? So trans transfer learning um, is very intuitive, just like people, how people think about problem. People have such kind of ability to transfer the knowledge we learn from one domain to another domain. For example, learning to recognize a table helps recognizing a chair. Uh, the skill of riding a bicycle helps us learn riding a motorcycle very quickly. So people have this ability. Um, uh, Professor Yang, uh, Yang Chang from Hong Kong uh, University of Science and Technology, he said, uh, transfer learning is the future of machine learning, solving the model adaption problem. Uh, deep learning was yesterday, uh, solving the future representation problem, and reinforcement learning solves the reverse problem, and transfer learning solves the adaption problem how you can adapt the model you learn from one places to another places. Here we have one example. So we usually have many data in one city. For example, in Beijing, we have rich data sets, like traffic data, meteorology data, point of interest data. But when you go to a new city, you probably have very limited data, or even you don't have some data sets. That's very general, okay? Can we transfer the knowledge we learn from one city to another cities so that we can apply our model? So that's a question, okay? So this is a publication of this year, which is called Transfer Knowledge Between Cities. I believe it's fairly important to solve the data sparsity problem, because in many new cities, when the new infrastructure was just built, we don't have a rich data. So how can we leverage the data from other cities? But apparently, you cannot directly apply the model you learn from one city to another city, because the data distribution is very different. So here's one example. We can see Beijing and Shanghai, Tianjin, the four cities has very different distribution of air quality data. So you cannot directly apply the model you trim from Beijing and to another cities. That's impossible, okay? You cannot apply the model we trim from New York City to San Francisco here because they have different traffic patterns. And also you cannot apply the, the data from New York directly to San Francisco because the things are totally different. And how can you solve this problem? What we can transfer, what we cannot transfer? Um, I think we can transfer the knowledge of relationship between different type of data. For example, when there are traffic congestion, the air quality tends to be bad. Such kind of relation might hold in different cities, okay? Even if the data distribution is very different. So the first thing we can transfer is a relation between the data. I mean the knowledge of relation between the different data. And second, we need to project the data of different city into another space where they share the same representation. So here we use a such kind of method. I, I will try to do a very, very brief presentation for this methodology, which is very complicated, okay? So first, we have different data sets from one source city and another target city. We can extract feature from different type of set data sets. S1 means data set one, data set two, data set three, okay. So this is a, the, uh, the, each row stands for one instance, and each column stands for one feature, and each block means one type of data set, okay. We have feature from different cities, okay. Now we need to project them into the same space so that they share the same representation, okay. You cannot directly pull them data from different city to train a model. That's impossible, okay. And let alone, there are some data missing problem. So we need to learn a dictionary based on the data we have rich data. Here we use a graph-based dictionary learning method. Based on this knowledge base, this dictionary, we can transfer the data of the two cities into a common space. Let's say we can project the data through sparse coding, okay? And this one, and we can transfer this data set from source city based on the dictionary into another one. Now they are in the same space. 
because there might be some data missing here, we need to some, do some max pooling. Then we pull the data from two cities together to do a training. In this case, you can transfer data from one city to another one. Okay, so two things. One is we, what we transfer is the knowledge of the relationship between different kinds of data. Second, we project the data of different cities into the common space. Then they can share the same instance to the training. Okay, okay, that, that's the process of the model. So you can finally, you can train the model. Um, you might be curious about how we can learn the dictionary. Uh, I want to mention a little bit about that, okay. So we can construct some hypergraph between different type of data sets. So for example, there are six regions in the city. Uh, for each region, there are four different type of data sets. From each type of data set, we can track some features. Well, different shapes stand for different features. Okay, features, features, okay. So different shape stands for features from different data sets. Now we have six regions corresponding to this six region here. Uh, for the data set of the same type of data set, we can connect them in terms of the, their similarity. For feature from the same category of data, we can connect them in terms of similarity, okay? For feature from different data sets, we can connect them in terms of geographic distance. Then we can formulate some hypergraph. Then use the submodular graph clustering, we can get some group with a constraint requiring each cluster has different type of data sets and has uniform distribution of label data sets. Then we can formula dictionary based on this cluster. Uh, I will not go to the details, okay? You can read the paper for more details. So that's the transfer learning, okay? Now let me summarize the methodology for cross-domain data fusion. That's fairly important for data mine, uh, for urban computing. Okay, and I believe this is a unique thing for big data. Um, the first one is called stage-based data fusion. In the first example I mentioned, uh, using mobility data to identify the problematic design of city. We first use the network to partition a city into regions. Then we project trajectory data onto the region to formulate some region graph. So the regional graph contains knowledge from both the neural network and the trajectory data. So this is called stage-based data fusion. I mean, you would use one type of data first and second type of data in the second stage. The feature-based data fusion, um, in the real estate ranking problem, we put together the feature extract from different type of data and combine it with some constraint like pairwise learning constraint and sparsity regularization. So that's called second one, feature-based data fusion. The third type of data fusion called semantic meaning-based feature fusion which is further comprised of four matter. Actually, I mentioned each of them in the example. Mm. So why we call semantic meaning based? Because we care the semantic meaning of each type of data and each type of feature we extract from data, the data. Okay. And also this follow how people think about data fusion. This is a more intuitive way. So there are multi-view based from matter. Uh, coaching is one implementation of multi-view learning. And graphing model, uh, matrix factorization, carport matrix factorization in the traffic example, we use this one, and transfer learning. So we, there is a survey paper on cross-domain data fusion. You can read the paper for more details about these methodologies. So at the last slide, I'm going to share my, um, my opinion about data scientists. Uh, okay, so data scientist is not easy, okay. Uh, first of all, he needs to understand the problem from the domain. For example, I'm not an expert of uh, environmental protection, but I need to know what is related to air pollution. Only knowing that, you can think about what kind of data you can use. So it's the second type, so second aspect, you need to understand the insight of each type of data, <coughs> instead of just a representation of data. For example, uh, GPS trajectory of test caps indicating not only the traffic pattern on road segment, but also human mobility pattern in the city, because we know where people get on the taxi and they get off taxi. Further, the human mobility of a region indicating is functional, affecting its economy and the environment. Only knowing such kind of insight behind the data set, 
then you can apply the data from domain, domain A to solve the problem in domain B. So that's very important. Third, you have to know different type of models, not only machine learning, but also database, data visualization, a platform, etc. Okay, well, and and, and um, so, sort of problems. Okay. So last one, you have to know a little bit about cloud computing. You know, need to know how to use cloud computing. Okay. So a data scientist is standing on the cloud computing platform, looking at the problem, thinking about the data, and putting the data, uh, feeding the data into different type of models, and aggregate this model organi organically, and deploy them onto the platform to solve the real-time problem dynamically. So that's a real data scientist. So it's very, very difficult. Okay. So finally, let me summarize my talk with three characters. Urban computing is a huge topic covering a lot of aspects from transportation to urban planning to energy consumption and environmental protection. But you only need to remember three characters. The first one, our vision is 3B, using big data to solve big challenges in big city. And second one, our methodology is 3M, data management, data mining and machine learning. And our result is 3W, win-win-win situation among people, city, and the environment. In an even shorter code, it's 3BMW. <laughs> That's urban computing. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>